Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our leadership development session tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the word will not be stale in any life, that everything we hear from the throne of God will bring fire, fervency, ambition to every life in Jesus' name. That will not be so familiar with the word that then the word does not bear fruit anymore in our lives, but that the word will penetrate every heart and yield perfect fruit and yield purposeful life and ministry in every life in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for this moment. We thank you because your word is ever new. We're asking, Lord, that as you have preserved the truth for us, this truth will do good in every life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Today we come to an important passage of scripture. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, that whatsoever things were written aforetime, they are written for our learning. That is, we ministers, we members of the church, and everyone that claims that he belongs to the Lord, whatsoever. In Genesis, in Malachi, in Matthew, in Revelation, and in between Genesis and Revelation everywhere. Whatsoever things were reaching a full time before this time. They were reaching for our learning. And so as you come, you have to learn from the word of God. You need to prepare your heart, empty your heart of past notions, past ideas, past opinion, and say, Lord, speak for your servants, your sons, your daughters, the members, the ministers are learning, ready to hear. They are for learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Already we have read from Genesis chapter 34, verse 1, through to verse 31. And we've seen a memory verse, the utterance, the declaration of Jacob. Look at that, Genesis chapter 49, reading from verse 5. Here is Jacob telling the story of his life, his observation, and what in particular he had discovered about Simeon, one of the sons, and Levi. And here we have in Genesis chapter uh, 49, we're reading from verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. And then it says in verse 6, it says, Oh my soul, the old man is coming to the end of his life. And now he's remembering what Simeon and Levi had done with the character and the instrument and the activity and action of cruelty. And he says, So my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly mine honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man. In their self-will they dig down a wall. Then in verse 7, it says, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and I will scatter them in Israel. Now, we have a choice 
whether to be bitter or to be blessed, whether to show the bitterness of anger or the blessedness of affection. We need to tell whether our lives will be that life of fierceness or our life will be a life of forgiveness. There is a choice tonight. The message is bitterness or blessedness. Choose. In Second Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? Whatever we do, any moment of time, we should not only think of the consequence at this moment of time. We should think of the future, our action, our reaction, when something has happened to a daughter, to a son, to a member of the family, something that shouldn't have happened. We act and react either in bitterness because we're not thinking of the consequence of our action in the future. Or we respond with grace, we respond with forgiveness, we respond with blessedness, we have a choice to make. And so, Abner was telling Joab, think about this. Would you want bitterness in the latter age or would you want blessedness in the latter age how long shall it be then ere before thou bid the people return from following their brethren as we look at the story today i want you to look at that last line the way we have been acting is it with bitterness? Is it with blessedness? How long? Don't you know that this will result into bitterness, not only in the latter age, but beyond the latter age on earth? How long? Are you going to tell? Are you going to beat those under your authority? Those under your tutelage, those under your influence, enough is enough. Are we going to kill ourselves? What has happened has happened. Make a choice. Bitter or blessed? Bitterness or blessedness? Make a choice. There are three things we are considering today. Number one, the bitterness of anger and revenge. Number two, the blessedness of the attitude of non-retaliation. Think about it in your life. The attitude of non-retaliation. Things will happen. And things have always happened. You retaliate. You take revenge. Do you say I give it to him. Even if he touches his blood, his life, I'll deal with him. Revenge, retaliation. But as we look at the teaching of Christ, our Savior, our Lord, in the things that happen in our lives, it says, blessed are the meek. And then he explains in the following verses, what we are to do, who we are to be, how we are to act, and pro we should be proactive, thinking about the future, and thinking about what this will be in the future, bitter or blessed. Number two, then, the blessedness 
of the attitude of non-retaliation. Number three, the believers with the armor of righteousness. The believers with the armor of righteousness. The armor we carry. The instruments we carry. The tools we carry. Is this of the beloved, the only begotten Son of God, will Christ act like this? With the believers in the early church, would they have acted like that? Would the father of faith, Abraham, had act, would he have acted like this? If we take this position, if we go this direction, a man, a woman, anyone, a minister, a preacher, a pastor, a coordinator, a group coordinator, a father, a mother, if we act in this way, will this be the perfect expression of the life of a believer? The believers, true believers, with the armor of righteousness. Let's come to number one. Number one, the bitterness of anger and revenge. Remember the story. Dinah went to see the daughters of the land. I think there's the other side of it. She went to be seen by the daughters of the land. You see, everything has two sides. The coin has two sides. To see the daughters of the land and to be seen by the daughters of the land. When we aimlessly move around, aimlessly go around in a new community, are we to see the daughters of the land or to be seen by the daughters of the land? Obviously, Hammon, Shechem, saw her. Not only to see, they will see you too. And if you go about without thinking of the action, of the character, of the people that will see you and what they will see of you and what they will demand of you, you have not thought well. And we're told that the son saw her, the son of the prince, and then took her. Obviously, from the story, it wasn't real. She yielded herself. And when what was done was done, she didn't turn back home. She stayed there. Because it was when they had, when Simon, Simeon, and Levi had destroyed that family, that house, that they took Dinah. She was staying there. You see, they will circumcise her. They will sanctify her. The depraved heart in roaming about and going about, there is something a longing in the heart of the of Dinah herself going that direction. And then these brothers of Dinah didn't even condemn her action. They didn't rebuke her. These were indulgent brethren. And the father didn't even say anything to her. Look at what you have brought on me and on our family. Nothing like that. There are indulgent parents, indulgent fathers, indulgent mothers, and there are indulgent neighbors. Your daughter has a tendency to wander around, to roam about, and you want to say, hey, Diana, don't do that. And the neighbors, they come 
and they say, leave her alone. She's just a little daughter. She's just a young girl. They wouldn't allow us to correct our children. It happens in the church too. If somebody is going the wrong direction, if somebody is doing something wrong, and the father in the house, not wanting to be an indulgent father, if he says, hey, Dinah, that's not right. All the age mates of Dinah, they will rise up and they will say, why should he address Dinah like that? That's, uh, you know, our sister. And even the adults, they will say, why? Why is the father in the house correcting the child like that? And yet, when the evil thing happens, they'll blame the father. Ah, but you are the one that didn't allow me to correct my child. When the child was still in his or in her formative stage, now you condemn me. Now you chastise me. Now you criticize me and you say, look at his son, look at his daughter. You are the one at fault. I would have, you know, said, my daughter, my son, you can't go that direction. But everybody will go against the father and say, why are you talking like that? Don't you know that children, young people, have their time of being at ease and at liberty? It happens in our church here. And so we need to look at the future and think of the future when parents are correcting their children. Now, Simeon and Levi, nothing else they could do except to show their anger and their revenge. Number one, the bitterness of anger and revenge. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the danger and defilement of aimless wanderers. Number two, the deception and damnation of angry wormwood. Number three, the denunciation and destiny of assertive willfulness. Look at number one. Number one is the danger and defilement of aimless wanderers. Look at Genesis chapter 34, verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bear unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. No record that she told the father, Jacob, and the mother, Leah, Daddy, Mommy, I want to go out. I want to go and see the daughters of the land. So that they would have told her, you're too young. This, these people are heathens. They are unbelievers. These people are sinners to the core. They do not have the same standard that we have. It is dangerous for you at your age to go alone. All right. If you're going to go, go with another sister. Go with one of your brothers two are better than one no permission look at verse two in verse two it says and when she came the son of hamel the hivite prince of the country saw her he took her and lay with her and defiled her she didn't cry out if a man finds a mage on the field and forces her and she cries out and there was no one to deliver her when that scene that acts comes out the punishment will be on the man because the lady cried out and there was nobody to deliver Dinah did not cry out it was a pleasurable experience for her. And so, as people wonder about, look at First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. In verse 13, it says, And without, they learn to be idle. 
wandering about from house to house. That applies to Diana. That applies to teenagers. That applies to older people. That did you not have an important essential thing to do? Normally in our adult life, we should have goals we set for ourselves. Goals for the week, goals for the month, goals for the quarter, goals for the year. And then when we start the working day on Monday, we're working towards our goal. Even if we're working from home or we're working in the office, we're saying this is what I should achieve by the end of the week. And if you are like that, you'll be asking yourself the assignment and the duty and the responsibility of this week, at what level am I? And so that will come roaming about anywhere. Roaming about today is not only getting out of a house and then uh, going out. Roaming about, you can roam about on your phone. You can roam about on the internet. You can roam about searching this and surfing this and surfing that. There are people that roam about so much they discover a man to marry on social media. The people that throw me about, they have friends, they've never met, they only meet on the social media. People roam about today a lot. Married people, they roam about. Men and women, they roam about and then they get into trouble. Now, it says they wander from house to house. Not only idle, but tactless also. And busy body speaking things they ought not. How could that happen? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. They have cast off their first faith. When people cast off their first faith, their first conviction, and their first level and height of character, then they can roam about. You know, sometimes people you don't know they get your number i get you know such uh, you know things uh, people will send uh, and they say just to greet you that uh, they and then they talk blah 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 and if they're using a uh, whatsapp you can see their picture there maybe some people even go to take those special pictures and you didn't know them if you reply them they were roaming about they got you. You are wondering yourself. But if you understand, my life is more precious than that. And my ministry and the value of my life is more precious than that. You are not allowed those who are roaming and they roam to your WhatsApp and then you accept them. You will take his time. You know how to block your phone from somebody who is a wanderer block that number and then he tells us in proverbs chapter 21 verse 16 it says in proverbs 21 16 the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding not only diana not only a woman not only a girl not only a teenager but the man the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead when your spirit is dead, your convictions dead, and your vision dead, and your future dead, because you're just roaming, roaming, roaming about. And you know as you use your phone and your tablet and your, the desktop, as you're looking for something legitimate, something will pop up. That thing that pops up, another one will pop up, another one will pop up, if you are a wanderer, you will leave your focus, you will leave what you are looking for, you will click the things that pop up and it will take you somewhere and understand all those things that pop up and you search for them, look for them and you become interested in them. The people who manage the social media they know all those things that you are pursuing and running after. And they know your name. 
They have the records. If they wanted to come out, eventually they'll tell you that this is who you are. You call yourself a Christian, holiness man, holiness woman, but this is what you follow in your serving. It says, those who wander away like that, and they wander away from the way of understanding, they will be in the congregation of the dead. Your conscience will die. Because as you do that every time, you don't have any standard anymore, any conviction anymore. Your conscience will be seared. And you'll be doing those things. Once you know, you think, hey, you know, my brother does not know, my sister does not know, my husband does not know, my wife does not know, my neighbors do not know. God knows. And the people who are at the back of that, what we call artificial intelligence, they also know that this is the pattern of your life. But now, conscience is dead. I pray the Lord will keep us in jesus name let me have a good good amen. amen number two here number two the deception and damnation of angry wormwood look at genesis chapter 34 we're reading from verse 7 it says in verse 7 and the sons of jacob came out of the field when they heard it and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, very angry, because he had brought folly in Israel in line with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Look at verse 8 there in verse 8, and come a commute of them saying, the soul of my son shake him longeth for your daughter i pray you give her to him to wife and then in verse 9 it says and make marriages with us the one not just asking for dinah now dinah is just to be the gateway for us to get to you Make marriages with us and give your daughters unto us and make and take our daughters unto you. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 13. In verse 13, and the sons of Jacob answered, shake him, and Amor his father deceitfully and said, because he had defiled Dinah their sister now if you don't have anything you can't give it whatever happens if you don't have anger in you whatever happens anger will not come out if you're carrying a bowl of water and somebody pushes you if the water spills only what is inside the bowl will spill if deception spills out of you, it's because deception was inside you. If anger spills out from you, it's because anger was inside you. It was not the action that caused the anger. The action only revealed the deception which was inside. They said, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister watch people something happens unexpectedly and angry language angry vocabulary you never thought the new came out of them now it's not that action that brought the vocabulary the vocabulary was inside and that thing that happened that created chance for the vocabulary to come out just revealed what you were on the inside. And so the deception was their nature, was their life, was their character. Only that what happened now brought that deception. And it says they answered deceitfully. Look at verse 14. 
verse 14 says, And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised. For they were a reproach, for that were a reproach unto us. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, But in this will we consent unto you. And he didn't show their face that they were lying. They are lie detectors that the government people use. That if somebody is telling a lie, that lie detector will know that that is a lie. Those of us who are not working with the government and we don't see, we don't have any instrument like that, you can tell sometimes with the look on the face, sometimes with the embarrassment in the person, sometimes with the kind of action that the fellow is not saying, but you can tell. And if you know the person that when this happens, that's what he says, when that happens, that's what she does, you can tell that it's a lie. But Shechem and Hamo did not see that this was a lie. And when God abandons any of us, and then he, grant, he gives us strong delusion that we should believe a lie. If you're a minister and, you know, people tell lies to you and you never know that's a lie and they set you running on the basis of a lie, it's a delusion that they might believe a lie and be damned because they are in delusion. You need to take care in your life that you don't take any decision. Any decision in ministry, any decision in your life, any decision that is going to be of great consequence because you are in a strong delusion because people are acting out lies. They are telling you lies. They are, you know, uh, kind of uh, making stories that will make you believe a lie. The Lord deliver us in Jesus' name. And then they said that every male of you be circumcised. Simeon and Levi took the sacred covenant of God, circumcision, and they used that to kill and to destroy. Are there people that take the secret doctrine honestly contained for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? They don't have any conscience. They take that sacred faith and that sacred, valuable, heavenly commodity and they, you see, they just throw it here and there to one another in making play, in making jest, in uh, telling lies and deceiving other people, in acting out, even in going on their journey of immorality. These people took the sacred covenant of the Lord and they said, you know, if you are circumcised, like we are circumcised, then we'll make marriages with you. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Then we will give our daughters unto you. There are people who speak confidently and they know they are telling lies. There are people who speak persuasively and they know they are telling lies. The people that have an injurious, murderous thought, plan, project, plan, and program in their heart to hurt their brother, to hurt their sister, to hurt their neighbor. And they speak persuasively. There are people that set traps for their neighbor, for their brother, for their sister, and they will fall into that trap and they will lose their life spiritually. They will lose their conviction. And these people, they become so friendly. And they say, you know, we'll do that only on one condition. If you will do this and do this, and they follow it up with a smile. And you are caught. And you are caught. 
If you are in strong delusion, you are caught. And then it says, and we will dwell with you. And we will become one people. And then in verse 17, it says, but if you would not hearken unto us, we tell you a lie. But if you will not buy that lie, then don't hope for any fellowship between us. Are there people like that? They tell you a lie. Your sense is a lie. And they're looking at you that your sense is a lie. And they say, okay, if you don't buy it, if you don't accept it, you're going to lose this opportunity. And then you forget yourself because you are looking for this opportunity. You are looking for this achievement. Now you buy the lie. God will deliver us. That's the world in which we're living. That's the religious community in which we're living. It says, but if you will not hack in unto us, to be circumcised then we will take our daughter and we will be gone and shake him and him could not picture taking Dinah my friend they're still going to take Dinah but they're going to take Dinah after you've lost your life after you've lost your conviction after you've lost everything you built up until this time. They're still going to take the diner. They're not making you the promise because they love you and because they want to be of benefit to you. You are still going to lose that diner. And they say, if you don't buy the lie, if you don't accept the lie, if you don't succumb and submit to this, we'll take diner and then we'll be gone. What has happened has happened. If you have to take Diana, it's going to be, we'll feel it because they already had intimate association with Diana. But uh, there's something you need to learn as a Christian, as a believer. You need to learn how to lose something happily, joyfully. And you see that is gone. I don't know whether that has saved my life. That is taken away from me. Good. I don't know. God has allowed that. Maybe that has preserved my life. Maybe that thing I keep at the price they're giving me to pay for that thing. If I do that, maybe I will lose my life later. Maybe I will lose heaven. Maybe I will lose conviction. Maybe I will lose everything. So if Diana is the only thing I lose now, God help me to bear the loss. What a great prayer. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, and it came to pass on the third day when they were so. That is from the circumcision the wound, the pain of the wound, when they were sore, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man a sword and came upon the city. Hold on. Simeon, those are innocent people. They didn't know when Shechem was making the deal for Diana. So if your anger is only because shaking a defiled Diana, even if you are going to express your anger, why express the anger on the whole city? It's difficult to limit anger. It's difficult to confine anger in our lives. Once you allow anger to take effect on a particular spot for a particular action, it takes away our thinking. We will not think, those are innocent people, 
the one you have a quarrel with is shaken. Even the father, one or two of the shaken as the father, I want to defile Dinah, but he killed everybody in the city, killed shaken, killed Amor. In our lives, the husband is unhappy, angry for the wife. And instead of, you know, between them both, my wife, I'm angry at this. I'm unhappy about this. They visit the anger on all the children. I won't pay their school fees. I won't listen to them. They visit the anger on the in-laws. They are angry with one person. They are angry with shaking. And the anger must be visited on everybody. They even visit the anger on themselves. They don't think about their future. They don't think about their testimony. They don't think about the value of their lives and their calling. And everything spoils in their hands. I pray God will deliver us. Look at that verse 25. It came to pass on the third day when they were sore. Have you been like that before? At school, I knew two friends, and one friend stronger than the other in our school, secondary school. And then when I can see the face of that one, I remember the name, when that one was sick, the stronger one. This other one that claimed to be a friend, then began to ill-treat that one. Punch, box, push, and all that. Because he knew he was now weak because of the sickness both of them they were not born again but it was bad enough now those who are born again that's what they say when they see that the other one is having distress sickness weakness this is the chance he was strong and now he's down that's the time to increase the distress when they are sore, when they are sick, that's the time to pounce on them and then to do evil. Where does the love of God in you? And then we are told, and they came on the city boldly and slew all the males. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, and they slew Hamor, a shaking. His son was the edge of the sword. Did they think of life after death? Did they think what we are going to do now? The consequence on them, poor shaking, poor hammer, and poor members and citizens of this city. Did they think that killing them? Is sending them to a lost eternity. Are you so angry with somebody that you will do something that will cut short his life, that will make him to go into eternity without being ready? What has he done? What has she done that will merit him? going to hell hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, a trillion years, forever and ever. If we thought of the consequence of our action, we'll not be evangelizing by word of mouth and then sending people to hell forever because you are angry. And really, you don't have any right to be angry. You've done something greater than that in the past, and God forgive you. And shouldn't you have compassion on this, your brother, 
on this your neighbor as I had compassion on thee. Let's watch that our action is not of deception that will lead to damnation because of angry bitterness. That word, one word there, means bitterness. We're looking at number three there. Number three, it says denunciation and destiny of assertive willfulness. You know, willful people are stubborn people. And you don't think about their action, about their utterance. They don't think about the project they pursue. Willfulness makes everyone, anyone that has that willful character to forget about consequences. That's why a son can talk to a father anyhow. Willfulness makes him to forget. Hey, young man, that's daddy. That's why a daughter will approach the mother in a very rude unthinkable way. Daughter, that's mommy. That's why a younger person will forget that the older person contributes to his life and to his joy. Young man, don't allow willfulness and stubbornness to make you forget that you cannot live alone. You need him. You need her. And so, if you are thoughtful, the willfulness will not be there. But look at Genesis chapter 49, reading from verse 6. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger. Be slew a man, and in their self will be dig down a wall. Verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Cause it be their anger, for it was fierce, it was senseless, it was furious, it was deadly, and their wrath, for it was cruel, I will divide them in Jacob, I will start, scatter them in Israel. Their action cut off the lives of those people in the city and cut off their offspring. The people that have been given back to by those people, their lives have been cut short. Their families have been destroyed. The king and the son had been destroyed because of what they were trying to do now. This Diana were trying to protect. What's the character of Diana? What's the future of Diana? How did Diana eventually get married? What can we read? Any good thing? about the progress of the life of that. Look at the person they were protecting. No future. And yet, they spoiled and destroyed their own future because of that Diana. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two, the blessedness of the attitude of non-retaliation. Three things here. Marriage relationship with reprobates forbidden by God. They were proposing, if this happens, then we'll give high marriage and all our daughters. Number two, malicious revenge and retaliation found among the godless. Number three, merciful redemption and reconciliation founded on grace. We're looking at number one, number one, marriage relationship with reprobates forbidden by God. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 1, then when 
the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, Neither shall thou make marriages for them. Even if they will accept to be circumcised, neither will they make marriages for them. Even if they will say, okay, we'll follow you to church, we'll change your dressing, we'll, we'll sing your song, we'll, we'll do what you do, neither shall thou make marriages for them. Thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto his son, and his daughter shalt thou not take unto thy son. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, we need to make sure that our own sons and daughters really are born again, that they are righteous. Just because they are our daughters doesn't mean that they are born again. That they are dressing like, you know, we dress doesn't mean they are born again. There must be that conviction that they have repented of their sin. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by conviction, not because of daddy, not because of mommy, not the, not the people who are saying, uh, I'll be following daddy and mommy to talk now when I grow old and I'm able to take decision by myself. I'm not going to go to their church with them anymore. Not those ones. The ones who are really born again and they do not have any interest, they do not have any attachment, they do not have any fellowship, any friendship ways the unrighteous what communion has light of darkness and then in verse 15 it says and what concord has christ with belial or what part has he that believeth with an infidel verse 16 tells us it says and what agreement agreement in marriage what agreement agreement in fellowship what agreement agreement in conviction has the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and walk in them I will be their God and they shall be my people in verse 17 it says wherefore come out from among them it is not at the time they are now coming home they are now saying daddy I uh, wanted to tell you something I didn't know I will tell you mommy I feel this may break your heart but this is me now. I don't want to pretend anymore. I have an unbeliever. I want to marry. It's too late. Watch over them. Pray over them. Instruct them in the way they ought to go. And make sure that they really have the conviction. Not because of daddy. Not because of mommy. God said I should not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. It says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, verse 18, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Number two there, number two, malicious rebellion. Revenge and retaliation found among the godless. Malicious revenge among the godless. And look at First John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 12. First John chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Not as Cain. Cain and Abel were brothers. Cain offered a sacrifice and God will not accept it. It was the work of his son. Abel offered a sacrifice and 
God had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And now Abel did not suspect anything. You know, the people who are angry, and you can see it on their face, and so you can run away from danger, the danger of anger at that time. You don't, they have not practiced anger, revenge, retaliation to the, to the point they can have it. And they have the bad thing in the heart, but you will not know. But the people who have perfected the way of anger, animosity, malice, hatred, and you will not see, Abel could not tell. They were together, and they spoke together, and Cain so managed his anger and covered it that Abel never suspected anything. Let's be very careful in our lives, because if we master our anger, and you were able to cover it, the same effort and training you gave yourself to master the anger and not to show it, and you're dangerous. Can't you use that same method to manage yourself and say, this is wrong in my life, that is wrong in my life, and you manage that, and you go to God, and the Lord gives you the victory, and then your life becomes straightforward, open, very clear. And if you are unhappy with something, you call the person and say, my friend, I am not happy with this. And the fellow says, are you angry? Sure, I'm angry. I'm angry at your action. I'm not angry at you. Otherwise, I wouldn't have called you. If I let you do you what you're doing and I didn't talk, you might perish because your life does not match up to the expectation of the Lord. I'm angry at your action. And then he's able to search all that. She's able to search all that rather than I'll not allow them to see that I'm angry. But the thing is inside the heart and you are going to do evil. That thing in the heart like the lion will come out and destroy. That's why it says not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Let's come to number three there. Number three, merciful redemption and reconciliation founded on grace. We need the grace of God. And it is the grace of God that makes us compassionate. It's the conviction we have in Christ that makes us truly loving and truly friendly. And we're redeemed and we're willing to reconcile rather than, you know, this has happened. Death will be the final penalty. Simeon, Levi, that has happened. It takes two to go into such a relationship. And your, and your sister you are defending, she's still there. She's enjoying what she's doing. Are you going to kill only one part of the, of the deal? And the other part, you leave alone. What are you telling Diana? You are telling Diana, go as far as you want to go. Go as high as you want to go. Go as deep as you want to go. We know it's wrong. We'll not do anything to you. We'll support you. We'll protect you. But we'll deal with the partners of evil. Be very careful. Oh, why are you partial? Why did you bring this woman? What caught this woman in the act of adultery and Moses' law said we shall stone her where is the man? why didn't you bring the man? why are you partial in your judgment? they shouldn't have done that we should have mercy 
through the redemption of the Lord and reconciliation founded on the grace of God. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 16, Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne 